Hi, Henry. This is Carl with the Houston Public News. Ah, uh, Carl, I am so sorry, man. Uh, these interviews have been running late. Uh, I'm, I apologize because they've all been kind of smashed together, and so they pick up one to three minutes of lateness per oh, yeah. interview. And I'm sure you've been calling, and I'm not trying to mess with your schedule. So <laughs> uh, I appreciate your tenacity. Hey, you're the last person on earth that has to apologize to me. Oh, well, thank you. Hey, my first question, Henry. Which one of your many occupations and roles in life do you most enjoy? Well, that's a good question. Um, the funnest, where it's like low stress, big fun, would be the radio show. Because I don't have to be seen. The music is doing the talking. And I can just go, I love this Ramon song, and play it. <laughs> yeah. So it's a low impact evening, and I, I quite enjoy that. When I'm in town, I, I have my radio show once a week. It's not that ambitious in that, you know, I, I didn't write any of these songs. I just go through my record collection and go, oh, goody. And I take a mail crate full of CDs and stagger down to the station. The, the hardest stuff I do is the talking shows. Gratifying, but very challenging. In that there's no script. It's just me and my intellect, or lack thereof. And if, if I don't have any good ideas, I'm screwed. And so thankfully, I, I have what I think are good ideas, and I put them up there. But... There's no backbeat to hide behind. There's no group effort. It's just you. Yeah. So one must be prepared and you know, really ready to do it. And, and so that's where, uh, that's the challenge. I like it, though. You know, I don't mind it. But it's, it's, uh, but it's not for nothing that you, you, you do your, your, your preparation. Yeah. The band stuff has always been fun. And like I said, you have a little bit of latitude of latitude there because if you screw up a lyric no one really notices I mean you don't get fined but you don't want to go out on stage and not know the music so there's a lot of preparation and discipline and, and exactitude there um, and it's fun because it's like you know being at a theme park you know it's like being on a roller coaster for an hour and a half um, it's all it's all interesting it's just there's uh, the talking shows are put it this way when I walk onto the bus to start a speaking tour like the one I'm doing in September I, I look at the itinerary and go, I'm never going to get through this. How the hell am I going to get through this? <laughs> Ten weeks later, when I'm walking back in the door of the office, I go, wow, okay, I just did that somehow. Great. So, you know, uh, just one, one show a day is all you need to do. Okay. My next question, Henry. Um, do you think you've gotten better as a writer, both musically and with the books and the spoken word stuff, uh, since you started at 16? Um, that's a good question. I think I've changed. Uh, you know, you get older, you move on, you move through different aspects of your writing. I look back at earlier writing of mine, and it's very visceral, very intense. And while I like it, it's not the way I'm going to write tonight. And, and if I did, it would be affected and you'd know that I'm just kind of trying to be that guy. And so I don't know if the old stuff is better and the new stuff is not as good, not as intense, not as whatever. I do know that it's different. I write from a more journalistic point of view now. It's more facts. Here I was. Here's what I did. Here's what it meant. Yeah. Where when I was younger, it was all through this kind of prism of expression. And, and so... I think I've gotten better at getting what I want out of my head onto the page or into the microphone. Um, I just don't know if it's better or not. Uh, I just know that it's different. Okay, uh, but, but the, the ethic is still the same. You know, be exact, be real, be honest, put it out there, and don't, don't you know, put it out there with, with a, an alarming lack of fear and restraint yeah. is, is, is the goal. My next question, Henry, is kind of a statement followed by a question. Um, I'm sure you can't help notice all of the, the stupid entertainment types getting busted for drugs and DUI and all that crap, you know, yep. right there in your backyard. Yeah. Uh, do you think that public figures, especially those that, that, that young kids look up to, should hold themselves to a higher behavior or moral standard or, or at least try to? That's a good question. Um, I, I don't think that anyone looks to Linda Lohan or Linda, whatever her name is, Lindsay Lohan, and says, my idol. 
I don't think anyone looks at Paris Hilton and says, "Well, I want to, I want to go to jail too." You know what I mean? I, I don't think they really have that much influence. Yeah. I don't think Britney Spears is going to want to make people marry idiots and, and breed. I think they're <laughs> going to do that on their own, no matter who raises them. And and so I don't really kn- I can't really chime in as far as their influence. Should they hold themselves to a higher standard? Not necessarily. I think they, they're going to do what they're going to do. Yeah. Um, as a, a voting of age American, like Lindsay Lohan, she's like 20-something. She can drink if she wants. And, but that's not what she's getting busted for. It's not She's getting busted for driving for DUI or whatever it is. Uh, well, Paris Hilton, but she's of age. So she's not drinking illegal. She's, she's driving under the influence. Should she hold herself to a higher standard? I don't think anyone in America should drive while drunk. You know, I'm sure you feel the same way, but oh, yeah. um, I think if you're going to be in the public eye, you should just be damn careful. And if you're going to be one of those people who's, you know, like sexy or whatever and have the paparazzi shoving their cameras up your skirt, uh, careful is the operative word. Higher standard. I don't know. I mean, I think everyone in America should hold themselves to the, a higher standard than the one they are holding themselves to at this moment. Yeah, in I that, like the you're doing good, that's great. Now do better. That, to me, is how I live my life, always trying to do it better. So I, I hold myself at a high standard knowing that I'm going to try and do more chin-ups tomorrow. So. Okay. My next question, Henry. Um, on a personal level for you, um, why is it important to you to show support for uh, the guys and girls in the armed services while you oppose the actions and policies of the government that sent them there? Well, because the soldiers are one thing and the government and the policy that sent them there are two different things. Yeah. And uh, the military I like. The military are men and women, very brave, very well trained, at very high risk going into these places to do the, the bidding at the pleasure of the President and the Secretary of Defense in defense of America, presumably. And how can I fault them for taking their orders? That's what they do. They'll invade Pittsburgh if they're so instructed. <laughs> it would be a, a violation of posse comitatus, yes, but you know what I'm saying. And, and so I, I don't see that, and that's why everyone likes the troops. Uh, hates the war, loves the troops. I don't think anyone faults the soldiers. So it's not, to me, at all something of how do you reconcile that? Like, well, easily is how I reconcile it. Yeah. You know, policy, one thing, and in this case, this foreign policy was dictated by people who never set foot in a boot in harm's way. You know, George W. Bush, not like he went anywhere in war. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld was in the Air Force, but not in combat. At least the guy was in the in the armed forces, but you know Dick Cheney with his five deferments, he's going to tell you America doesn't have the stomach for war. Man, you better shut up. As far as you know, who doesn't have a stomach for war, Mister Five Deferments? Yeah, because you don't have one either. And you know what? As a conscientious American, you know I don't have a stomach for war myself. I think it's abhorrent, and it, look, look what it does. I'm supposed to have a stomach for that? You show me, you see those pictures. I'm supposed to have a you know, go, yeah, hell yeah, man. <laughs> That's, you know, once I get a stomach for that, start worrying about me. And if you get a stomach for that, worry about yourself. In any, or get help. In any case, um, that's why when the USO came calling, I didn't walk up to it. I ran at it. Grateful and honored. Great. My next question, Henry, is kind of on a, a lighter note. Um, how cool is it that your fans run the gamut from middle age punk rockers to young kids just discovering your back catalog? It's amazing, and I'm you know nothing but grateful. Yes, yeah, it's, it's 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 completely amazing to uh, meet people bringing their parents, parents bringing their kids, teachers bringing their students, students bringing their teachers. I see all of that at my shows. It's incredible. I get, you know, for a TV show, I get letters like, Henry, I'm 71 years of age, and I love your show. <laughs> I go, well, okay. <laughs> right on. 71. All right. Yep. Uh, Henry, you are just about the last person that I can ever see doing something half-assed. 
Um, where did the spark in you come from that drives you to give 100% effort and dedication to everything that you do? I'm, I'm mad. It's anger that's my main fuel. And I'm not mad at you. I don't kick dogs. I don't, you know, throw rocks at cars. I just, it's kind of a healthy level of rage that kind of courses through me at all times. Um, just the, the rage to live, just to get up there and do it, to see, to affect change in my country. I love America, so I want to make it better. And you got to get in there and get your hands dirty to do it. And so it's um, it's what makes me travel. It's what makes me get up at you know I'm at my desk usually by 6 a.m. every day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so I I got there at 5:57 today. Just made it. <laughs> um, and and I wake up and go okay I'm gonna I'm gonna kick this day's ass. I'm not looking for a walk in the park and you know Bambi to come out and get patted on the head. I'm gonna kick some ass. I like that attitude. Yeah, and, and that's what keeps my blood thin and keeps me going. I'm having a good time, but it, it's all about, you know, getting in there and, and giving a good day. I wanted to ask you about um, about teenagers. What would you say to a young kid that grew up like I did, uh, repressed, oppressed, and depressed, to give them hope or maybe light a fire under their ass to get them through the tough teenage years? Well, that... I would remind them that well, a that's how I that's how it was for me. I like the way you phrased it. Um, and what helped me was um, music. Punk rock really helped me. And the idea that of the power of the individual. And a lot of young people get feel real bummed out because they're not going to be the quarterback, or the pretty girl doesn't like them, or all that you know that peer pressure stuff. Because as we are in transition of defining ourselves. We are looking for things to reference. That's why you look up to this guy in the band, or you look up to your dad, or what, because you don't have yourself yet. That's that's clay. You're molding it. That's what those awkward teenage years are. You 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 are building this thing that's going to be you when you walk out of twelfth grade or whatever. And so in that time, there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of questions, and a lot of awkward, dumb moments where you look back and go, ah. You, know, you cringe at the things you said to girls. Yeah. You, know, you, you go, oh, man, I'm glad that wasn't taped. Because <laughs> it's just embarrassing. But you meant it because you're, you're in transition. You're a work in progress. And so young people should be reminded that your teenage years are hard for any teenager. I mean, I always say that teenagers upon people hitting 20 should get a Teenage Achievement Award for surviving their teen years. Yeah. And uh, even if they did stab their father to death in their sleep when they hit 16, like I wanted to, but of course never did, they should get the award even if they're on death row. Um, because it, those years are so so hard and painful, really painful, real pain, you know, but stuff that kind of dictates how you're going to live the rest of your life. And it will give them hope to say, like, you get to be an adult at the end of all this, and you're going to like it. You know, in the meantime, and, and the bitch of the thing is, the irony is you get to be my age, like 46, and you look back at those awful times and go, man, those are some of the best times I had. So I would advise, you know, a non-destructive course. You know, like, I know you want to do drugs. I know you never want to leave your room. I know that everything sucks and your parents don't understand and, you know, everyone is awful. I know. I agree. They were. But... You you know those, those who you really like you know the Ramones or whatever band you're into they they saw something different they got out there you know they they did something unconventional yeah and they didn't kill themselves you know and, and I I see a lot of depressed youth you know I get a lot of letters and they go you know I, I can't stop drinking I'm like whoa you're 17 you can't stop drinking that's a that's you know that's really bad. And so it's easy to become self-destructive because the frustration and the pain is real, very real. And But you have to meet it with positivity. And I'm not trying to say, oh, you know, everyone sit around and hug. But, you know, you got to take all that energy and pick up a guitar or a paintbrush or a basketball or a mountain bike instead of just, you know, or a typewriter, you know, but instead of just grinding your own guts. And once young people get a sense of accomplishment, for me it was weightlifting. Once I 
I, I, you know, when I'm, you know, three weeks into weightlifting, when you're lift, lifting 20 pounds more than you were at the beginning, you realized you earned that. When I saw that, that was the beginning of me just kind of, I don't know, kicking ass and taking names. Because no one can lift the weights for you. Yeah. And that was a big deal for me. You know, I, I lifted weights really hard for months and one day looked in the mirror and went, holy shit, man. I got some, I'm, I'm here now. I got <laughs> size. I'm not saying everyone needs to be some weightlifter guy, but for a, a, a skinny, <clears throat> excuse me, teenager, that was a big deal for me. It, it, it might not be the thing for everybody, but it was a huge confidence builder for myself. I got the one. weights never teased you. you. You could go into the gym and not have some, hey, faggot, what's up? Yeah, you, you didn't have to endure that. Yeah. And have the guy chuck the basketball at your head, which would be my fate at the gym and so there were the weights and I went well okay and I, I started working out on my lunch you know lunch break at, at, in high school because the gym would be fucking empty and I, I'd throw my shorts on and you know crack out a few sets of bench or whatever and run back to class and you know so you start filling out that shirt pretty good it's basically everybody find their own path in life yeah and, and you're going to find it, you know, some guy's going to find it with his paintbrush. Some guy's going to put on ballet slippers. You know, I mean, everyone's going to, but you gotta, you got to find that and not spend 15 through 18 just kind of spinning your wheels, yeah. chain smoking, self-hating. But, you know, that self-hatred is a, def, is, is a defining moment, too, and we all, we all get into that. Yeah. Uh, but it's very difficult to be young. And I wonder what it's like to be a young person now. I was a young person in the 70s when there wasn't like, you know, hey, we're, we're 14, we're all going to get laid tonight. I mean, that was not on. I, I, was, I didn't fear a 10th grader with a gun. We didn't say acquired immune deficiency syndrome. You know, there was, Carter was president. You know what I mean? It was a, a different time. Now, the young people are very, they're not even adult. They're just kind of old young people yeah. now. You know, and that's internet, that's MySpace, that's families where both parents work now, you know, to bring home the same relative pie slice that, you know, a parent, a single parent could do 20 years ago. So the, the dynamic has changed. The metabolism of families has changed. The metabolism of cities has changed. Everything is saying, you know, like double time. So young people grow up very quickly or they're forced to be in a, some mutated adult position without the real depth and the maturity to, to back it up. And, the, you know, we, we all pay the price for that. Um, you know, and it's important that Americans understand that all Americans pay the price for that. Yeah. And, and if you don't dig that and get it, know it, you, so shall you pay. You know, and, and you have to be part of changing that. That's why I'm a, I'm a part of the Partnership for a Drug Free America. I, I contribute a lot of money to this orphanage, to that organization, to this organization. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm just saying I, I realize there's work to be done. I, I, I don't not see a problem. I see a problem. Yeah. And I see something that needs to be maintained. My countrymen. And I'm not beyond reproach. I'm not the shining example. But I'm also 46, and I'm not going to commit suicide because the girl won't talk to me. <laughs> You know what I mean? I, I, you know, I have more of a Tom Waitsian approach to life. You know, it's Wednesday. She left. They're still serving breakfast. You know, I'll all survive. Yeah. You know, but I remember when I was young and, you know, the humiliation of being a young person, all that difficulty. Henry, uh, a couple of minutes ago you were talking about the, the path in life, and it kind of leads into my last question for you. Um, if you hadn't joined Black Flag and started down the road that, that you're still on, what do you think you would have done with your life? Um... I get asked that a lot, and I've thought about it a lot. Um, immediately, I probably would have left the ice cream store I was working at and probably jumped on a, a, an employment opportunity at my local record store, the owner I knew. Uh, I don't know whether I would have had <clears throat> anywhere near the success in music. I probably would have been in another local band, yeah. and that probably would have broke up, and that probably would have been it musically for me. And I probably would have just uh, had a very normal working life. I, I do not know whether any artistic uh, will would have been made evident at all. 
I, I have no idea. I, I suspect probably not. Uh, I was very lucky. I mean, you know, that job, I auditioned for it, and I actually beat other people out for this chance to sing in Black Flag. But it's a hell of a door prize. Yeah. You know, it, it was a an amazing opportunity. And I'm nothing but lucky. That's all I am, just lucky. But to my, for, uh, I must say that at least I acted upon it. I didn't sleep on that chance. I made something out of it. And Black Flag, I was, I was only in Black Flag for five years. The band broke up, literally almost to the day. Like, like, like it was like five years in a day. Yeah. Uh, in the same town I joined them in is the town we uh, did our last show, Detroit. And, and so, you know, I took a bus to meet them while they're on tour in Detroit, and the last show, the last tour was in Detroit. So in any case, um, that was 1986. That's 21 years ago. I've covered quite a lot of miles in that time yes you have I've done done a few things and so all of that i attribute to you know hard work and whatever but it was the black flag thing that really gave me a great opportunity to realize all the stuff i got going on now could i realize all that in dc without the knowledge that I, there's all this stuff I could do that, of my potential, realize my potential? That's a really good question, in which I will probably be speculating upon when I'm sitting in a, uh, in a chair on a porch wondering if anyone's going to change my diaper today. Yeah. So. Well, Henry, we're four minutes short of uh, my time allotment, and I wanted to end by, by thanking you for something. And it, it's something that, that you didn't do on purpose. It's just your place in life. Uh, I was one of those kids that was repressed and oppressed and depressed, and if it wasn't for you and, and the Ramones and the Beatles and Jello Biafra, uh, I would still be stuck in a that strict conservative Southern religious upbringing where I was no good and everything I did was wrong and I was on a, a road to hell. And you showed me that there was a world out there full of culture and music beyond the little corner of Texas I grew up in. And I oh, that's great, man. Thank you. Uh, you have a great Friday and a great weekend. I'll see you on the, the Spoken Word Tour. Okay, man. I'll see you down the road. Thanks. Thanks, Henry.